Taylor, help me out. <laughs> Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for your ROH Super Card of Honor post show. Holy cow, we are kicking off an incredible weekend of wrestling in general. Man, oh man, I know the SmackDown show was on before. I know Alex Pulaski was doing his SmackDown and AEW Rampage review on Fightful Select for you. I got a new setup. I got my man Eddie Kingston here because I don't care if he lost. He won in my heart. That's all that matters. He's winning right here. He's That's my so dude. <laughs> <laughs> Something that's been fun about this weekend is I've been able to, to have some people on that I haven't normally gotten to stream with all that much. And that is true tonight with Kylie. Kylie, thank you so much for coming on with me tonight. Very excited to talk some ROH with you. I'm so excited to be here. One, because it's ROH. And two, because it's you. And... I feel like our chemistry is so strong. We need to share it with the world. It's true. We are in love and we are in love with ROH. So it is yeah. a good, good thing. Some people calling out my setup. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm going to be a grown up by the end of the weekend. It's going to be fully set. I'm going to be so happy with things. But guys, <laughs> get in your super chats. Get in your humper chats at humperchats.com. If you're new to us, and you're like, what on earth is a humper chat? What maniac would approve such a thing? What kind of boss would allow people to say Humper Chats? Well, it was our boss who came up with it. Humper Chats at HumperChats.com function just like Super Chats. However, uh, we get to keep a little bit more of the kashish when you use HumperChats.com. It's a, a funky interface, but we definitely get to keep a little bit more money. And we'll take this opportunity also to ask you to leave a thumbs up if you would be so kind. It helps people find us in the algorithm. It's actually like extremely helpful. You guys have no idea how helpful it is and, and helping people find us. It really helps us get momentum. And on top of that, we will tell you to subscribe to FightfulSelect.com. You're going to get Alex Pulaski doing sour grabs behind the paywall tonight. It's probably going on or might be finished at this point already. You're going to get me behind the paywall with Alex Palowski nights one and two of WrestleMania. Also, we'll have the NXT stand and deliver post show for you as well. That'll be on the main channel right back here. No sleep for the wicked. I feel bad for those NXT talents that have like a 6 a.m. call time. I'm sure the women have to do their hair and makeup even earlier. Hopefully somebody's buying them Starbucks like CM Punk would be. But guys... <laughs> We're not here to talk about any of that because we get to talk about Super Card of Honor tonight. I'm absolutely stoked to get to talk about this. This was a really great show. That didn't surprise me at all. I had high expectations of it. What did surprise me a little bit was some of the booking that we're going to get into, not just with the world title picture, but that Reach for the Sky ladder match. I was pleasantly surprised by the booking. I didn't know it was going to go that way. So we're going to run down the card. We're going to do so with the delightful Kylie. Feel free to get those chats in. We appreciate you sticking with us. I know we're starting at 11.15 here. <laughs> late one. Some thoughts off the top. Jam Beard saying, Kate of Honor, does the new setup come with new internet or still the potato? Uh, a little bit of both. I have a new setup, but I don't have it actually set up yet. So I'm, I'm working on that. It's all coming together this weekend. I'm hoping by Stand and Deliver tomorrow, I will have the highest functioning internet that Optimum will allow. But I can always <laughs> rely on BR underscore doctor for all of my IT needs, Doc Mueller. But we'll actually put out put over the uh, the giveaway that he's been running on Twitter. So go check him out. Some more thoughts coming in from you guys. Chi Town Spurs saying, what a show, some incredible wrestling, but maybe not the feel-good moments we were waiting for. I, mm -hmm. I am intrigued about those because I think we've still got some more story to tell in a few of those storylines. I think Tony wants us to buy Honor Club to watch the journey, and I will be tuning in. I'm loving Honor Club so far. The interface is so much cleaner than if you were subscribed before. My only thing is Honor Club used to include, I can't remember if it was the pay-per-views were included. I think they were heavily discounted. Um, and now we're paying full price for pay-per-views, and it's $10 a month, which is a little bit steep, but... Right now, it's my favorite wrestling program on television, though Dynamite yeah. has had some banger weeks in a row. So this is my favorite presentation in wrestling, I will say. Um, Kylie, what are your thoughts on the overall tone of the show, um, both from the wrestling that we saw tonight and, again, a, a couple of booking surprises from where I'm sitting? I thought it was a really great show. Like, just from an in-ring perspective, I thought every match... In every match delivered. I don't think there was any weak links. 
Um, there were a couple booking things that I was, I didn't see the vision at first. I guess I'll say that maybe some, some disappointing uh, losses some disappointing wins, but like you said, I do think there's more story to tell. And I think the one for me, the biggest letdown was of course, Mark Briscoe losing, but now I'm more inclined to watch every week to see Mark Briscoe work his way back up and get his win. So I, I kind of get it. Sure. Um, but overall, I just like looking over my notes, I don't think there's anything that was bad on this show. It was a great show. Long, but really great. It is a Tony Khan pay-per-view, so it's <laughs> going to be long. But I, I agree with you. Um, we'll, we'll talk about things a little mm -hmm. bit more as they go on, but we're going to go through some of these chats. Thanks for being so supportive. We really appreciate it. Supercard was awesome, especially the main event and ladder matches and a great start to the weekend. Also, happy Trans Visibility Day. Thank you, Kylie. Happy Trans Visibility Day to you. Fightful is for everyone. We don't get overly yeah. political on here, but I don't view, and I don't think anybody at Fightful views, trans rights being human rights as political. You can hang out here. You're safe here. Our incredible moderator, Louise, is working his tail off this weekend to make sure that any POSs are not in our chat per usual. So... Happy Trans Visibility Day. Matt Raquel. Matt is always awesome and supportive to us, too, yes. saying, it's my girls, Kate and Kylie. <laughs> I support this commander of my kingo, sweet mother of God. That's what we started with. That is what we started with. We're going to be getting into that momentarily. But Orion Ben 666 saying, live from the bangs, Kate. It's Kate and <laughs> Kyle's ROH forever. Oh, I love it. I love it. I am. I'm working on it. I got I got some cool lights going on. I think they're malfunctioning a little, but we're going to figure it out. I'm very excited. I invested in my setup because I'm not going anywhere in the podcast world that much. I knew and I'm not leaving my apartment anytime soon, I guess, I, which there was a possibility of. So we're rocking and rolling. We got the soundproofing up. We're kicking butt. We're going to get there by the end of the weekend. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so some really, really good stuff. <laughs> Jam Beard putting the Alex Pulowski pressure on you right away. The most important question of the night for Kylie, does she have any impressions and can she sing? Hold up. All right. This was a long pay-per-view. I got a long weekend ahead of me. I'm sure Kylie does too. I don't know if we have time for like the madness that we bring to Tuesday nights doing impressions and songs. We'll leave that up to Alex Pulowski. You can catch him on Select and make him do those things. Some people feeling the pain for me with Eddie Kingston, but we will get there. I do want your thoughts. We're, we're not going to go too depth in it, but we had a really, really fun zero hour. I feel like consistently zero hours are great because they're really that appetizer that leads you in. I feel like sometimes with AEW, um, their pre-show and WWE as well, there's still efforts to develop stories, which probably makes a lot of sense. But sometimes I'm like, just give me real high quality matches, which is essentially what we got tonight. Not completely void of story, but I do just love that it's like, we're not just getting like, oh, an hour of wrestling. Like we're getting an hour of damn good wrestling here. We got Jeff Cobb defeating Hot Sauce Tracy Williams, Takeshita going over Willie Mack, Willow Nightingale defeating Miranda Alize, who I was very happy to see back, and Stu Grayson with Evil Uno defeating Slim J with Ari Davari in his corner. Um, what were your thoughts? Any any highlights that stuck out to you? I guess what I really loved about this zero hour is just that, okay, a lot some of the matches didn't have story, but they were fan favorites. And to me, that's a great sign for Ring of Honor that Tony's willing to put people like Jeff Cobb, like Takeshita, like Willow, who are we're used to seeing featured on AW Dynamite willing to bring them to ring of honor and not only bring them to ring of honor to feature them as the, you know, the lead in guys that buy the pay-per-view guys. I really appreciated that. I like seeing Willow, especially in ring of honor because I do when ring of honor was first starting and they didn't really have a women's division. I really wanted the, the division to be centered around her. And I like the direction with Athena, but I would like to see Willow, you know, win a title. And I don't see, you know, that happening in AEW soon. And I really think she deserves it. And I think her momentum is just carrying her really far. So I really enjoyed seeing her here. I thought she looked great. I thought the crowd loved her. And of course, I'm always going to love Jeff Cobb. I think Jeff, <laughs> I think Jeff Cobb just can't match with Kenny on Wednesday was unbelievable. Yes. Unbelievable. Really happy to see him here as well. He just he's just such a special talent and it's, I don't, I don't want to talk new Japan, but 
I do like seeing we him. Can talk, we're gonna have to. We <laughs> we got we got some crossover tonight that is unavoidable. So talk away. I thought this match was great, and there's and I think people, if you watch New Japan often, you understand there's something different between Jeff Cobb when he wrestles on a North American show and when he wrestles in New Japan. He just adapts to the styles, and this to me, I loved this, and. I don't know if Jeff Cobb is going to stick around in the AW Ring of Honor universe. If this is just him coming over for WrestleMania week, I don't know. But I would love to see Jeff Cobb do stuff with some other people in Ring of Honor. Like, you know, new champion Shibata, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> just, um, maybe, so a lot of the younger talent that are being brought into Ring of Honor. I don't know. I just want more Jeff Cobb. I wouldn't be mad to see more Jeff Cobb on my television. He did have that one appearance where he was like a mercenary of the inner circle that we never saw him again in the AEW. I forgot about that. So <laughs> funny and weird. And is like one of my favorite fun facts in a weird way. But I uh, ag agree with you. He's such an interesting talent because he, I don't want to say like he moves well for a big guy because I feel like that gives you a different visual than what he does. He is built like a truck. And he moves well for a truck, I would say. The V trigger yeah. he gave to Kenny on Wednesday. Sorry to keep going back to that. Um, but mm -hmm. I do feel like uh, we've gotten to see some really, really cool work out of him in the past uh, three, four days. What's also fun is just the weekend that this has evolved into. Everybody's in LA right now anyway. So it's like Jeff Cobb could probably work eight matches over the weekend if he wanted to. This, of course, being one of them. But... I love seeing that. I love getting to see combinations of people you might not normally see. I think, um, you know, Shaza McKenzie just got to the United States and we got to see her on the last episode of Ring of Honor. So there is some ambiguity around who's working where just in the contract sphere. Impact has weird contracts. Yeah. We don't fully know, like, what's going on with some New Japan talent. We don't know what's being built for Forbidden Door. And then within that landscape, you have ROH and AEW, who are clarifying not only who's on ROH and who's in AEW, but also who's in the tag division and who's in the trios divisions of these different places. So I'm I'm very intrigued to see where things shake out. And we're going to talk about that, but I agree with you more Jeff Cobb on my television as much as possible, please. I thought this was a really good match. I also love Hot Sauce. I think he's great. He mm -hmm. has worked really, really hard. Um, and, and come a really, really long way. That's what's kind of fun with ROH. It just feels like we get super clean stories with iron sharpening iron. Um, and you, I feel like you get to see a ton of growth because people are tested in so many different contexts with trios and tags, but also that pure division is so, so interesting. I think it's some of Wheeler Yuta's best work and we're going to get there. But I feel like I've seen that with Tracy Hotsoff Williams a whole lot. Um, uh, Jam Beard saying the best match of the zero hour was the women. They all kicked ass in that match. Also, welcome back, Vincent and Dutch. Very happy yeah. to see Vincent and Dutch back. They belong in ROH, in my opinion. They've been a little bit at Impact. They've been a little bit backstage at WWE, I believe. Um, I really, really just feel like they were such a stronghold in, in Ring of Honor kind of before it shut down. So, very happy to see that. And Kylie, very happy to see Nigel McGinnis back on the commentary desk. This yes. was such a wonderful um, surprise that I was hoping would happen at some point. I didn't know if it was going to happen tonight, but I'm always putting over Caprice and Ian because I think they're the, the best duo in wrestling. I also like what Impact's doing a lot. I love Kevin Kelly. Taz and Excalibur, also fantastic. But for me, Ian and Caprice add so, so much. And they have such a challenge right now because you have lifers who love Ring of Honor tuning in and you also have people from AEW who are kind of just discovering what ROH is about in this new generation mm -hmm. to satisfy audiences who have no idea who some of these talents are and ones that are diehards is actually really, really tricky. So um, very happy to see Nigel McGuinness joining the desk. I feel like he fit in immediately, felt so comfortable, had so much value add. What did you think of Nigel McGuinness being back at ROH? This was such a surprise for me. I, it didn't even cross my mind thinking about my predictions for the show that Nigel would be here. And not only that he would be here, that he'd be on commentary. And I do think, especially in moments, you know, and we'll get to it in matches where there, the anticipation was high, the anxiety was high. I think he really added a lot to commentary. I think 
you know, Ian and Caprice, I love them, but there's something special about Nigel McGuinness with his accent, really selling this distress. Uh, I thought he really added a lot. It was a nice surprise, both for, you know, new fans, but for old fans, I think it was, it was, it was for the diehards. <laughs> He's never going to give up his feud with Brian Danielson. I respect it, appreciate it so much. But he also does a really good job of, he was kind of like the heel commentator without shoving it down your throat so much. One of my favorite moments on commentary tonight was Caprice talking about in a month he'll be married for 20 years and he goes, less time for murder. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ian Riccoboni is like, I'd love to give a shout out to my beautiful wife, Sarah. It's her birthday. But I was like, we get the marriage of two decades shout out. We get the... My beautiful wife, Sarah, and Nigel McGinnis just saying less time to murder people. Absolutely, absolutely had me in stitches tonight. CO saying, I didn't realize how much I missed uh, Nigel. Loved him in NXT. He was fantastic in NXT. I always mm -hmm. thought it was a mistake that they let him go. I'm glad they released him if he didn't want to work there anymore. But that commentary desk on the UK side was so great. Great time to be a fan of ROH. Bang, ring. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Oh, man, so much fun to be had. So much fun to be had. Louisville saying that uh, refreshing to have. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm reading the, the wrong chat that was on my brain right there. I thought we had another commentary chat, but we'll move along. Um, We'll get into the full show, but I agree with you. More Jeff Cobb on my television, please. A really fun zero hour. Always love seeing Willow. To your point, I think they viewed her as the temple of the ROH division, but she just got over so fast on AEW. She was getting such Crazy. strong reactions. I think they were like, we need to keep her for the depth of this AEW division. And Ring of Honor was so delayed getting out the gate. Like she kind of found herself in this outcasts versus newcomer story and everything. So I don't know what her role is going to be, but it does feel to me like she's on the AEW roster to stay, Kylie. Yeah, it does feel that way. And I do love her in AW. I love that she's involved in this uh, outsider uh, homegrown talent feud because that's the core of the women's division. That's where all the stars are. So to me, that says they really value her. I just want her to be in a, not a better spot. I want her to be treated as more than a side piece to a story. I want her to have something that is her own. And I feel like in Ring of Honor, she was really gearing up for that to be, you know, the big baby face winning the title, you know, all the cheers and applause and so on and so forth. But I don't know, maybe she'll get like a TBS title thing going after the story's over. Maybe she's going to do something with Ruby. I don't know. But regardless, if regardless of where she is, what she's doing, I love Willow. And that's that. <laughs> Love seeing her on my screen, an immediate shot in the arm. Miranda Alizé, I also wanted to, to call out. I was very glad to see her back. She was a huge part of the women's tag tournament, or not a tag tournament, just the women's ROH, Women of Honor tournament that yeah. Maria Canellas had put together not too long before it shut down. Your finals for that were uh, the now Roxanne Perez on, on NXT, then Roxy and Miranda Alizé, and they, they did a really great job with that tournament. I would love to see as many women as possible who were in that tournament return. I would love to see Max return. I would love, love, love that. But Alizé has, has really, really grown. Her pacing has gotten like leaps and bounds tremendously better since then. Um, really encouraging to see. And I just, I was one of the few people watching ROH before it shut down. I feel <laughs> like people have joked with me. They were like, oh, you were one of the seven people. I'm like, yeah, it was. It was my favorite hour of television and wrestling because it was one hour. Everything made sense. Very happy to see those things starting to, to come through. Very, very happy about that. But um, we are going to start with a match that I was like, this match has to kick off the show. There is nowhere else in the show that this could go. There's too much happening in the title pictures, and you can't just, like, wedge this in somewhere. It's, you got to lead off the show with your AAA Mega Championship, El Hijo del Viking Vikingo versus... Commander, I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to try and pretend I can throw a Spanish accent on that one. But uh, Louisville saying that refreshing to have authentic Lucha Libre given the respect and time it has always deserved. Commander and Vikingo killed it. And also flowers for Athena. Can't wait to talk about Athena later. CO saying rewatching Vikingo and Commander. Holy crap. It's that good. You had to go back and watch it again because there's no way you're getting everything you want on that first pass, Kylie. 
This had so many incredible yeah. spots. Ultimately, the champion retaining here, not a huge surprise. I, I kind of assumed this one would break this way, but if we sit here and talk about spots that impressed us in the match, I'm just going to be calling out the whole match. So I don't even know fully what to call out, but there was some crazy stuff in here. What were your thoughts? I loved this match. I really liked um, that Vikingo was leaning into his strength, not so much his high flying ability. He was very much like the body guy in the match. And commentary was really reinforcing that. Like, look how strong he is. Look at this. Look at all these things he can do. He's not just this high flyer, which was interesting because in his Kenny Omega match, he very much leaned into his athleticism, his high flying ability more than this, you know, strength. But there was a lot of, to me, instances where he just out muscled. And I didn't realize how big he was, how, mus like muscular, how muscular he was. Yeah, yeah, compared to Commander, who's not like a skinny guy. Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying he is. But Vikingo was just incredible. There, I really liked um, the spot, the, I think, failed table spot, the 630 into the Oof, table. Yeah. At that, the table didn't break, but I really enjoyed that spot. I the 630 though, there was like so many 630s in this match, just over and over and over again. And I just listen. <laughs> I don't if you, I don't know, I don't have a problem with 630s with 450s, what have you. But if you, it's just the, when Commander does one, and then Vikingo does one, and then Commander does one over and over again. Um, as a false finish, I think it loses a little bit of the drama of it sure. all. But I will say that Vikingo, his, I don't even know what you would call it. The the finish, the knees to the face in the corner, then up into the 630. I really liked that. Though it was probably more like a thousand 630. I think that that man got up there and did like 10 revolutions in his 630. But regardless, I love this match. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it to see what I missed. Yeah, I think um, there were a lot of things that it, it, I'm not an anti-flippy do person, but it, it isn't my favorite style of wrestling. So I kind of resigned mm -hmm. to myself that this is probably going to feel a little bit more spot festy than what we saw with Kenny on Wednesday, just mm -hmm. because I feel like one of Kenny's greatest strengths is creating stories out of matches that don't necessarily have one. I don't give a crap yeah. about the vignette discourse at all, but I will say... <laughs> um, I kind of assumed this was going to be a lot of spots. It was going to be incredible athleticism. It was going to be incredibly creative athleticism, which I think did show through in this match. Two of the best at just walking the ropes. Some crazy, crazy stuff that we saw there. Um, a couple of spots that did make me nervous just from the perspective of when you're going that fast and you're that athletic, it's very easy to overshoot. And that happened a couple times. And even though they yeah. were fine, I was just... <gasps> For a little bit so <laughs> but i mean what a what a match uh loved to your point commentary talking about the respect for lucha libre talking about the importance of that triple a mega championship and um really putting tony khan over which was almost weird uh, you got a little weird with putting tony khan over it was a little too much thank you tony khan no thank you commander by kingo but they were <laughs> pushing for that rematch i'm sure they're gonna get that rematch probably in triple a would be my guess I, I would think they would probably want to run it back on that stage very cool we got to see this here part of the fun of this weekend is you're just gonna get matchups like this because so many people are in town so an absolute absolute blast adored Opening with this because such high energy. And I don't mean the tag team with Coco Beware and Owen Hart when I say high energy. <laughs> I mean legit high energy. So references to that in Techno Team 2000 pop me every time. So come at me with your high energy references, people. I love it. <laughs> we move along to your ROH six-man tag championship. I loved the sequence of this card because of things like this. This was a completely different match than you were going to get. Uh, between the Embassy, Brian Cage, Bishop Khan, and Toa Leona versus, of course, with Prince Nana in the corner, A.R. Fox, Blake Christian, and Metalik. This kind of went the way that I assumed it would go, assuming that um, like Brian Cage was sticking around, or at least sticking around long enough that he was going to be able to do business with this. AR Fox, Blake Christian, Meta League felt kind of just thrown together. I keep saying it sounded like they rented AR Fox for this match. The way that it was set up a little bit. And in the respect of two, he just got out of a trio with Dante and Darius. 
Um, so I, I didn't think that felt like a trio that you you belt up. I'm guessing maybe, you know, we get the embassy with a nice little run here. If Brian Cage does end up leaving, Dalton and the boys seem like a really good way to go. They might be viewing Dalton as a breakout star, though, like with the reactions he's getting from arena to arena, which just warms my heart. <laughs> it makes me so happy for him. But this was a really fun match and and a completely different match than we just saw. One thing I love about ROH is that palate cleanser, right? So what were your thoughts on what we saw here? Yeah, coming into this match, I wasn't that excited. There's no... I think this was a match that I think most people were just... The story isn't really there. I don't think a lot of people uh, have... A, great emotional attachment to the embassy yet you will because i love them but to me toliona was kind of the star of this match he did a lot of athletic things brian cage he does athletic big guy stuff too but toliona i think there's something really special about him and i love that he was part of um, ring of honor 2.0, I guess, when Tony Khan was doing his first Ring of Honor pay-per-view and they introduced Toliona and Khan. I think they're really setting them up to be something major and special in Ring of Honor. And this was a great performance for them. I love Blake Christian. I love AR Fox. But it, like you said, this is a thrown together team, but they were still impressive. I think Blake Christian has kind of, at least from on my Twitter experiences, he's kind of <laughs> faded from the discourse of like the up and rising stars. He's um, guys like Nick Wayne are always in that conversation. Billy Starks is in that conversation, but he really did remind me that Blake Christian is a talented guy. And I would love to see Blake Christian, Toliona, all these guys, maybe not Brian cage. Cause I don't know if he's leaving. I don't know if he's staying, but regardless, I think the big strength of this match was, young guys working just as well as the older, more experienced guys in the match. And I loved that because that's something you, that is so special about ring of honor. Agreed. And one thing that I love too, was AR Fox in this, just he's having these incredible performances, I, no matter what context he's put in. I said it on uh Thursday night as well, which was just yesterday. It's been very long 24 <laughs> hours guys. Bear with me. I can't believe we're getting these back to back. However, uh, AR Fox has just shown, like shines so bright in every context he's been in singles matches trios with Dante and Darius this trios match and I agree with you on Blake Christian you know I was so excited when he signed to AEW it seemed like he might be someone that got pivoted to ROH but because mm -hmm. it took so long for ROH to get underway it kind of felt like he got a little lost in the shuffle he was just around eating some losses on occasion he was just kind of a mm -hmm. hand that was around and even in the earlier phases of ROH he's had a storyline here which is nice but he really did show out tonight. I tweeted that my favorite three springboards in all of wrestling are LSG, who is an ROH talent as well, um, Giovanni Vinci or Fabian Eichner, who has a phenomenal springboard in Imperium, and Blake Christian. I think he's got a really nice yeah. springboard. And then I was like, I am a nerd. I have a top three of springboards in my brain, ready to go at any moment, but really, really good <laughs> stuff tonight. And his was like a springboard into, I think like a, a 450 or something insane. He was showing out tonight. Absolutely love it. And you know what else I absolutely love? I love Drew and I love Drew all the time. No more than when he sends us enormous super chat. So everybody get on Drew's level, help us make a ton of money today so that Kylie can be like, Reg, I'm taking her spot. All right, you can go out there and go hit on some hot moms when you're there live. But I made money like Drew was sending out. This daily Drew is just one of the kindest, best people in the whole wide world. I got to meet Drew at Grand Slam. We got Scissor, he's the best. But he's love to Eddie, love to Mark, love to Dante, and love to Kate and Kylie. Sending you love right back, Drew. Have a, just the best wrestling weekend you can. Very fun show, minus a few sad losses and a terrifying injury. Really thinking about subbing to Honor Club now because I'm loving the direction ROH is going. Well, you keep dropping super chats like this. I'll just give you my login. Okay, it's worth the risk. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> keep throwing this down, Drew. My goodness. But you guys I listening. <laughs> <laughs> what? No. I don't use NordVPN.com. Oh, what are you talking yeah. about? Don't worry about it. Uh, I, uh, I, I feel like so far for me, 
um, Honor Club has been worth it just because we've also gotten to see things like they put up uh, Briscoes versus FTR there for you for free to access. My hope is that uh, that library builds out into something bigger. Maybe we get some New Japan content on there. Maybe we get a bigger house for things and other mm-hmm. wrestling that needs a home on American television. Um, I would I would love to, if they built that out with some New Japan content. I would be the happiest gal. Or if they just put AEW behind that paywall and maybe changed it from Honor Club to to just something that was a little more all encompassing. We don't have yeah. a home for AEW content, which almost four years in, it, it kind of seems silly at this point. Uh, give me what I want, Tony Khan. Yeah. Please. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I want the Viking, the Vikingo and, uh, oh my gosh, Commander rematch, just like Ian Riccoboni was buying for. And I also want somewhere that I can go back and watch my old AEW content with these. But I do think that would be an interesting approach is to have kind of a, a hybrid of, of content for American wrestling television behind that paywall. Marcus I Ryan's agree. saying, give me AR Fox and Vikingo, please. Yes. I, yes, yes. Um, I do also, after two weeks ago, I think it was really, I like need AR Fox and VSK or Jeeves SK. Their um, work together in the trios. I was like, that's the one. <laughs> like, this is the singles match I need out of these trios. Uh, absolutely. Just felt like the chemistry was there. All right, champion. Relax. All right. Saying one problem with that, Kate Drew can't trust your internet. That's not how logins work, okay? My potato login is the <laughs> issue. My potato service is the issue. You can blame Optimum for that. But really, really, really fun stuff. Um, we are having trouble with the Humper Chats tonight, so as much as I put them over in the beginning of the show, if you can stick around with Super Chats, that would be fantastic. I'm sorry if you sent in a Humper Chat and we don't have access to it yet. Luis is working on it. The platform's just being a little bit funky, but we will make sure if your questions or statement don't get read here tonight that they get addressed at another time. But, oh boy, moving on from the opener, which was a hell of, a, or I'm sorry, the, the second match, that six-man match, that was like an awesome direction to go in. We got followed up by the women's match, which kind of surprised me. I thought this was going to go on later, but the type of match we got, I think this actually fit perfectly in this slot because it was yeah. slower and holy hell was it hard hitting. Absolutely loved the story here. Mike McVaney saying great show tonight for me. Athena is in her groove. Boy, is she yes. ever. This is a feud that got built out on dark. This was incredibly hard hitting. I loved the story that was here. I loved commentary selling me the story about Sakazaki working injured and Athena just leaning into the fact that she was injured and wearing her down and wearing her down and wearing her down. That entrance with Athena with the porcelain doll. I was like, what the hell is this? And then she came out and stopped on it. I was like, damn, holy cow. Really, really fun touch to just add there. There were no like grandiose entrances. There kind of generally aren't in ROH. That's just not the style, but that was like a really easy, clean way to do something that was super impactful. They beat the hell out of each other. And I am loving this version of Athena. What were your thoughts on this match? Athena retaining, by the way. I love this match. I specifically loved how stiff Athena was. And I know people still on the internet, they talk about how stiff she is, that it's unfair, whatever. But I loved this because Yuka is, at least for AEW fans, she's always been embraced as like this, this joy, this, you know, this light in the world, kind of like Riho. People love Yuka. She always gets a pop. People are always excited to see her. Um, with, yeah, with her working injured, I think fans are already a little bit worried because she's clearly taped. You know, she's visibly injured. Or, you know, worked injured. Uh, And Athena really, really leaned into that. And there were a couple spots where I was like, oh, that is so dangerous. Um, Just Athena just throwing her around, yanking her down from the ropes, all sorts of things. But in the end, I think think Athena as Ring of Honor champ, women's champ, is a great decision. Uh, I think Athena and AEW kind of got lost a little bit but she's really found her groove and I love her as a heel. I loved her entrance. I was the doll 
I kind of froze up. I was like, no supernatural stuff, please. But yeah, it wasn't no, no, please don't go the spooky route. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the same reaction. It wasn't. It was, it, <laughs> it was just her being, I, I don't know, maybe it was a reference to some, like an anime or something. Well, I, I think the, the porcelain doll thing, she's been talking about porcelain on, yeah. on Dark in this, so they uh, had stomped it out, but... But yes, with the, and with Yuka, the the magic girl that we've got here too. Um, Just destroyed. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. We got a, and, and, a, and, a chat that came in that said Yuka actually won the TW I didn't G, know that. TJWP tag belts legit earlier today. Pull a double duty, I guess. That's wild. Okay. That is wild. I love that. Yeah, I didn't know That's that. That's part of the fun of this weekend, man. It's yeah. just like everybody's everywhere. It's such a blast. I'm very excited for it to come back to the East Coast because I wasn't going to go sit in LA traffic. Nope. Not happening. Not, Not for me. me. <laughs> really good stuff here. I do have to ask, who do you think is up next for Athena? I don't know. And that's tricky because we're kind of entering the season um, where AEW kind of gets crazy with Double or Nothing coming up and Forbidden Door 2. But I honestly would love to see someone maybe like a like a sky blue or a billy starks really like get that pure young youthful baby face run in ring of honor and really establish them there because there's a lot of ways that they could go with this both ring of honor and aw wise or even like forbidden door wise bringing someone in to give athena a match but i would love to see athena really get a get her teeth into a story and have someone else really get their teeth into it and have a feud that carries for months, maybe to double like double or nothing weekend, maybe past it for a long time. Because I think Athena really, as much as she's she has the momentum and Ring of Honor's getting going, I think that title and that division needs a stronghold and a story to really, really hold on to. This this Yuka story was great, but we need something a little more dimensional. So I would love to see someone like Sky Blue rise to the occasion. I love Sky Blue. And I think, you know, she's been involved in the AW Outsiders story for a little bit. But I, I'm not sure she fits there as well. So I'd love to see her in this spot. I'm really intrigued. We're seeing some people mention, and uh, I got some some messages, that mm -hmm. at the scrum she is calling out Kyrie and Mercedes Monet. So I'm wondering if, that just opens the door of, are we going to get a bigger presence than AEW at Forbidden Door? Mm. Are we going to see ROH crossover? Because, man, Athena versus Mercedes, I don't know if that was something like we got the right treatment for when they were both in WWE. Holy hell, that would be a lot of fun. Kyrie yeah. as well. I really like this. I really... Um, it's really important to have someone that is an established champion in ROH on the women's side right now because... I don't think we fully know who the division is. So yeah. it is really, really good to have someone doing matches like that. And, you know, week before last, we saw this really great proving ground match with high end that I thought was really, really good too. I also just love proving ground matches. They're such a reasonable and logical way to set up <laughs> things. I'm like, when I saw, oh, when I saw proving ground matches come back, I was just like, this was everything that I missed. Everything that my heart had been waiting for, for the past year. I was like, I love, Proving ground matches. I love things that make sense in yeah. wrestling. I love rules. Give me rules. I'm a square. I get it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> really, really fun stuff here. And then a match that I think surprised a lot of people. I wasn't fully surprised by the results of this match. I was more surprised by the results of this match in tandem with what we got in the main event. We didn't really get a lot of feel-good stuff on this on this kylie um but we did get a really great match between mark briscoe and samoa joe really 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 so good, good storytelling and strong in ring here my heart just exploded when he went to go tag his brother that wasn't there my just tears just immediate tears um and thinking about that sincerely him being in an roh ring without his brother is something that's incredibly new like in a very, mm -hmm. very real way. So I'm sure reaching for his brother was a, a very different experience. But Samoa Joe ultimately winning here, um, not with an, a resolved finish, I would say. I feel like this was a good way to keep Mark protected. But he's another one that I'm kind of intrigued to see where he goes. I don't think, um, 
you know, I, they went through everything that they went through with Warner. Is he going to go back to ROH and not even be on Warner Television? What, where, where are we going to go next? Are we going to get a rematch out of this? To me, for some reason, I have felt like Samoa Joe is not done with this title. Now that Eddie Kingston's lost too, I feel like they should give us they should give us Samoa Joe versus Eddie Kingston. I deserve yes. that. I, as a fan, deserve it. They should do it for you specifically. <laughs> for me, they should be yeah. like, this one's for you, partner. <laughs> That's it. That's all I need in my life. I need a walkaway spot somehow. I don't ever see Eddie Kingston go to the top ropes, but I still need it to happen. I need these things. Um, but Samoa Joe coming out with the win here, I wasn't fully surprised. Just, just gut instinct. I didn't have any reason to believe um, from a wrestling perspective, but I was like, I just don't think this run is done for Samoa Joe. Though, mm. obviously, would have been completely reasonable to lean into the the feel-good moment here and, and give that to Mark, especially with him saying it's his destiny. It kind of feels unresolved. What were your thoughts on the match and the booking here? The match was really great. I It was physical, of course, because it's Mark Briscoe and Samoa Joe. I really liked Mark Briscoe wrestling with like a sense of urgency that, you know, he's just fighting and fighting and fighting because he so wants to win it, not just because it's his dream, but he wants to win it for Jay. And it's very much, he really played into, you know, in the match, thinking of Jay, feeling Jay's presence, which was such a big part of the story. Um, I think Mark Briscoe was just an absolute star in this match. The, Booking for me, I understand that maybe Mark's story isn't done. Maybe Samoa Joe's story isn't done. I'm willing to trust the process here because Ring of Honor has not let me down so far. Um, and I do, commentary did really sell that Jay Briscoe, his dream was the Ring of Honor World Championship, which he did win. Mark is, you know, this TV title he wants to, for himself and for Jay. And his family was there and it was so emotional. Um, I just... I feel like I, w- I would have given it to Mark sure. with, with his family there. His sister was there. His mother was there. His children were there. It just would have been a feel good moment that I think the show really needed. I do, especially with what we got kind of later here. Yeah. Um, I thought for sure Eddie was going to go over if Mark lost because I felt like People are also very in on the idea of Eddie Kingston winning. He quit AEW just to come here. We'll get to that later. But I agree with you. I also think there's something very authentic about the idea that he couldn't do it without his brother on the first go. Like there is yeah. something really um, like emotionally heavy about that that I mm-hmm. that I like. But I do understand like the the overall idea of like just give the people what they want on this huge stage and. Um, yeah. to a really deserving guy in front of their friends and family. I completely get that. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why I, I felt like Samoa Joe was the right call here, but um, I I do feel like... I, I do feel very intrigued to see where Mark Briscoe's journey goes, both in the literal sense of, is he going to be on AEW television or an ROH? And mm-hmm. from the sense of, what does this loss do to him as a competitor? Um, definitely not turning heel because I think he, they couldn't if they wanted to. Um, but I really did like this and the Briscoes, like Mark Briscoe showing it today. I always say they're just like the most, they were two of the most unrepeatable performers in the world. Like there is nobody in wrestling that goes out and does redneck Kung Fu or any of this. Like <laughs> nobody's out there doing things the way that they're doing them. He's such a fun combination of like a maniac who is a, the maniac you know not like the maniac that you're like oh I gotta stay away from that guy he's the guy that you're like that guy's nuts I love that guy <laughs> like, <laughs> I adore that about uh Mark and I, I loved that about both of the Briscoes um this this one I think zapped the crowd a little bit too the crowd was a little bit off I, I feel like all night it's a very very long weekend out there yeah. Also, who knows how it's mic'd. They weren't running out of their regular venue. But this one, I definitely feel like I was like, oh, they let the air out of the room a little bit. Um, but I'm intrigued to see where it goes. We will see. We will see. Trust the process. <laughs> Trust the process. And I, I will, too, because we're we're so early in it. I don't have full reason to distrust it yet. Yeah. You know? Well, here's a match that was literally just added for funsies. I'm just going to say we got Tanahashi and Daniel Garcia 
and it did not disappoint. I was nervous we were going to get a little bit of a Jericho run in. I'm glad that we didn't. Um, I literally it felt like they were just like, let's put a bunch of guys in some sort of generator and whoever it spits out have an awesome match. That's that's kind of what happened here. Absolutely adored this match. I expected it to be great. This was better than great. This was phenomenal. Yes. <laughs> so many fun nods in this match. Um, I, I just loved... Daniel Garcia always looks like he's trying to win a match. And I know that sounds so silly, but it is like such a fundamental wrestling thing that can get lost a lot of times of mm -hmm. it's not somebody trying to get their offense in every ounce of whether he's on offense or playing defense a little bit. If he's trying to get out of a hold, always looks like he's trying to win. And I really, really like it. I also adore just the I'll never not pop for you're a wrestler chance being something that's supposed to be like an insult and get his goat, uh, especially with a guy who is as clear cut of a wrestler as Daniel Garcia is. Uh, what were your thoughts on this? I, I loved it. I loved this match. I especially loved, and I think they're probably going to build for Tanahashi Jericho, maybe forbidden door down the line. I love toothless Tanahashi. I think <laughs> poor guy, but I think it's so funny to see, uh, I really, Garcia is such an interesting wrestler psychologically because the sports entertainer pro wrestler thing, the, like he, there's a clear dividing line in his personality when he wrestles, when he's in sports entertainer mode and when he's in pro wrestler mode. And it's really interesting in a match like this and some other matches, his Danielson match, uh, these big matches where you can see him shift from sports entertainer into the pro wrestler mode. Um, he's still such like a, highly proficient technical wrestler and we he needs another danielson match he needs <laughs> i'm so sick of him being in the jericho appreciation society and i i don't like the sammy guevara stuff um but i think this match really proved that garcia even even in a loss that he can be a star because the crowd was kind of dead for most of it and it wasn't until Tanahashi got him in um, the clover leaf, that the crowd mm -hmm. was really waking up. They they were really buying into that submission hold. Um, Garcia is just such a special talent, though. He's just he's so young, but I think there's so much promise there, and I just want more for him than the JAS. <laughs> sure, sure. That's been one really fun thing about. We're definitely going to talk about it with the pure match, which I was extremely surprised by. Kind of gives guys a place to spread their wings a little bit. I loved what yeah. Wheeler and Garcia did um, in, in their feud. <clears throat> but I also love that we've gotten to see them face other people now in ROH. This was obviously a dream match of sorts. And you also just never know, like, we have Forbidden Doors now. These guys can go work G1s if they want. Like, there's so many possibilities that when you start the history here, it kind of reverse engineers it if they're going to have some sort of history in Japan or if this is going to build to mm -hmm. something bigger at Forbidden Door. So I love it. I agree with you in that I feel like initially the Jericho Appreciation Society was great because I think everybody knew Daniel Garcia was a great wrestler. I don't think that many people knew how absolutely hysterical this guy is. Like his, his comedic timing is unbelievable. He's so... Um, if Jericho is Will Ferrell, he's John C. Riley. Like he's the understated mm -hmm. guy who's super, super funny all the time. Um, I got to see him on the Jericho cruise and they were facing the acclaimed and Max Kester said something extremely benign about his mom. I forget what it was, but his mom was shoot on the cruise and it was like the most mild thing. He put his head on the ring post and just sat there completely shattered by this extremely mild line <laughs> so committed for like a full minute and a half or something i mean just head on the ring <laughs> ruined he's very very funny i feel like the jericho appreciation has served its purpose in letting us see that um i would like for him to move on i kind of feel like the jericho appreciation society in general has moved on not only yeah. do i want to see the people that are in it break out a little bit we haven't seen Jericho as a singles wrestler at AEW at all. I'm kind of intrigued to see what that looks like. So we'll see where that goes for today, though. Um, what an incredible match from Daniel Garcia and Tanahashi. Tanahashi, too. We've been talking about Garcia this whole time. He's pretty good, this Tanahashi fella. Uh, no slouch in the ring. I did love that that Cloverleaf kind of looked like the lion tamer. I know Ian Riccoboni mm -hmm. kind of alluded to it on commentary. 
thought that was like a little bit of a nice wink and a nod. I feel like Garcia, because he has such a diverse skill set, is constantly doing that as a heel, pulling out other people's finishers against them and their mentors' finishers and things like that. So really, really like that Tanahashi kind of turned the page here. But what an incredible just like wrestlers wrestling match. Like Bret Hart was just sounded off about your Vikingos of the world. He would have liked this one. There's something in ROH for everyone, and that's a part of what I like about it. So good stuff here. Uh, we've got some more love that came in for a couple of previous matches that I'm going to run down real quick. Uh, who said this? Jam Beard chiming in again, saying that for Forbidden Door, have it be Hater versus Monet versus Athena. Holy hell. Those two in a match against Hater, <laughs> but also further the Outcast storyline. That's a really great point. Um, I'm not going to yeah. be mad about that. I don't even like triple threats, but I'm like, give me that one. <laughs> That would be a, a ton of fun. A ton of fun. Um, it does feel like it would be Mercedes Monet versus Jade. I do feel like most of Jade's upside are presentation-based and character-based and charisma. Mm -hmm. I feel like for how high Mercedes Monet's in-ring ceiling is, she's just, you know, I mean, literally a decade and a half further along than Jade at this point. I, yeah. I would love to see her be able to test herself against athena or a jamie hater in that sense but i also get the idea of that bitch show versus that boss show man that is sitting right there i wouldn't be money. <laughs> mad at that it's money and i mercedes if she does kind of mix it up in aw there's so many dream matches to get through there's so many wrestlers you know i would love to see her versus Sheeta. Riho, Britt Baker, so many matches. But to me, I think the Jade one is the biggest money match that they could do with her. Um, I I think you're right. And what's tough is they're kind of booked into a corner right now about, okay, yeah. when are you going to do that? Because if it's for the title, I feel like Mercedes has to win. So yeah, what are we then doing with Taya Valkyrie? Like there's a, lo a lot of moving parts here. Oh, sorry. I'm like drinking this water because I got a long weekend ahead and my voice is already hurting. So we are going to move along a little bit. Um, our wonderful moderator, Louise, pointing out that we also have announced Athena versus Yamashita on our witch television next week. Oh, Lord. Those two are yeah. going to beat the ever-living crap out of each other. I'm That's looking forward to fan. seeing that. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, another chat that we got from Peyton Carter about Samoa Joe versus Mark. Uh, he says that it fits the story with Samoa Joe winning. Mark has never wrestled without his brother, and he stepped in the ring with one of the best wrestlers of all time. He even tried tagging out at one point. Yeah, I had kind of referenced that spot, and I do like the story. I just also like it when people get what they want when they watch wrestling, but I don't think it's a betrayal of the story, which is why I definitely have room for it. I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. Um, but we didn't get a lot of feel good moments at all on this show. And it felt like for a, a first pay-per-view out of the gate that they might lean into something, uh, but they didn't. So we'll, we'll see what's next. I'm definitely intrigued. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> back here in toothless Tanahashi versus Daniel Garcia land. Jamber saying that Tana didn't use the lion tamer. It was a high Texas clover leaf that Ian compared to the lion tamer and the way Tana headed it on him. Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of kind of splitting hairs there, but um, yes, I, I felt like it was an intentional little nod in a way. Yeah. Uh, but we will move along to a match that made me really, really nervous at a lot of points, uh, and yeah. rightfully so for one of them. Uh, we've got our Reach for the Sky Boy Ladder match with OGK, Aussie Open, um, LFI, Top Flight, and the Lucha Brothers, who went over here, which was a really great booking decision, in my opinion, that I can't believe I didn't see coming. I felt like an idiot after <laughs> it happened, because we saw Mark Briscoe yeah. in a three-man <laughs> with the Lucha Brothers. We saw him in a trios match with these two guys. They gave us a little wink and a nod, and I'm sitting here like, I think it's going to be Top Flight, because you got the brothers in going. They're the young upcomers. Lucha Brothers makes so much sense. I didn't ever feel like um, they 
couldn't have a chance at it, but I really thought it was either going to go top flight or if Aussie Open was sticking around, I thought it could go that way too. I even thought OGK might have had more of a chance against them just because you could set up some really fun chases with OGK having that. Tons of history with OGK and the Briscoes right before mm-hmm. Ring of Honor shut down. Um, but the Lucha Brothers winning is a nice surprise. I love that these titles went to a set of brothers. I thought that was yeah. part of the reason Top Flight would go over as well. Um, yikes for Dante Martin. Um, I I just hope that that guy's all right. Um, mm-hmm. Very, very scary moment. There was also a moment where Fletcher landed wrong. Um, I hope he's okay. Definitely was not as scary as what seemed to have happened with Dante. And Kylie, we were talking before we went on. That happened on something that didn't even feel like... I wouldn't even put it in the top 10 craziest moment, yeah. spot, moments of this match. Like it, it, uh, it just goes to show you... You know, I was having this discussion with a friend of mine before who was saying, like, the Vikingo stuff makes him nervous and he doesn't really love spots like that. I can mm-hmm. understand that if you want to mitigate risk. But I also, you know, I always point out that, like, Adam Cole over-rotated on a lariat and was knocked out. Like, at, or I'm sorry, Adam Page. Adam Cole, you know, has been out with nine months from a concussion on a spot that just mm-hmm. went a little bit wrong. Big E's career ended on a botched suplex. Like, it tends to actually not be the super high spots that are kind of taking people out. Now you can make arguments about mitigating risk and what that does to people in the long term, of course. But, um, you know, it it just goes to show you that all of wrestling is dangerous. It all needs to be um, treated with care and respect. And every time someone steps between the ropes, they're they're risking their health. And that is never lost on me. Wishing all the best to Dante CO saying amazing show crowd could have been better. I don't know if they were fatigued or if it was mic'd weird or what, but I agree. It felt like they were not yeah. as present as I was waiting for. Uh, wishing Dante the best of luck going forward. Can we agree we don't need spots like that going forward? I don't know, Kylie. I kind of said I feel like this wasn't even one of the most it insane wasn't. ones. But there were a few hold your breath ones in there. But yeah. some really, really, really fun stuff, too. I love the decision of the Lucha Brothers winning. I didn't even have it really on my radar. What were your thoughts? Yeah, like... I just want to say this to me wasn't a crazy spot that Dante was injured on. Like we've seen Penta do this um, Canadian destroyer spot. We saw it with Matt Jackson off the top of a ladder down through a table. It's just one of those freak things where he, he lands a little bit weird and it happens, but this, there were a lot of crazy things this match. I have so many notes, but um, in general, it was dive after dive after dive after dive, but it was so good. And what I really love about this is that it really did feel like any of these teams could have won it, and mm-hmm. it would have been it would have been acceptable. I feel like they were all valid contenders for the titles. So every time someone's climbing a ladder, I'm buying into it. Yeah, I'm like, oh, <laughs> That's oh, Ben is going to get it. Oh, Roosh is going to get it. I did. I. I thought it was going to be top flight or the Lucha Bros because of the the brother angle. I thought it was more likely to be top flight just because the Lucha Bros uh, were so involved in the AW Trios division that it's it's like, I don't know if they would be in, in ROH, but it's the Lucha Bros. And now thinking about it, that's the best decision they could have made. Like there's no more, there's a, ta- first of all, people love to go out of their way to watch the Lucha Bros. Yes, because they're they're not always on AW TV. They're sometimes they're in Mexico. Sometimes they're doing other things, and people will hunt them down to watch them. So that it was a good business decision in that sense. But I also feel like they're just the brother story with these two because of the relationship they had with the Young Bucks and the relationship the Young Bucks had with the Briscoes. I just think they're a natural fit, and I thought they were both great in this match. Um, they didn't take as many bumps as everyone else, but <laughs> that, that's fine. Uh, but I really, really liked it. Um, I also thought, I thought Bennett and Matt Taven also, I think they need to get their flowers because they really sold the emotional element of this match for me, especially with the Briscoes connection and how close um, the kingdom and the Briscoes were as, as ROH talents. So I just want to shout them out because I really feel like they sold a lot of the story here amidst the Lucha spots. <laughs> Agreed. It is really important. I feel like, or I really beneficial, I should say to have a team that maybe this isn't their go-to style as yeah. much. And I feel like Mike Bennett, especially Matt Taven as well, but I feel like Bennett has really 
started to kind of show out in a way that maybe people didn't realize he was capable of before. His match with Darby mm-hmm. Allen on Rampage was so phenomenal. His match a couple of weeks ago in ROH was so great um, against Dante, I think. Um, yes, because they did David and Darius the next week. His match with Dante was unbelievable. Um, really appreciated them here. And you're right, not only did it feel like they were emotionally driving in the story, commentary again, killing it, talking about their history, talking about Mike Bennett's broken neck, talking about all these things, talking about the history with Roosh and Mike Bennett, really putting the pieces together. If you weren't familiar with ROH for why every team is in there, there was a part of me that thought maybe they called an audible after what happened to Dante and to put the Lucha brothers over. But then when I remembered that Mark had tagged with them, I was like, (laughs) of course this was the plan. And to your point going forward, um, you know, who can make other teams better like more productively than Lucha brothers, like to help young growing tag teams. I mean, my goodness, like really, really a a great call there. Very excited to see what happens. Very excited to see if we run some stuff with them versus LFI. I think there's a ton of ways she could go. Um, And after the match too, I want to call out the fact that FTR was there to present the new titles, which I was really hoping they would do. I knew they were in town, obviously. And it just made me very happy to see that because you know, they put on arguably the best tag matches in history together with those guys. Mm-hmm. And Jam Beard saying Taven almost broke into tears before the match even started just as they got in the ring. Mike Bennett very visibly um, in his in his feels in a way that he should be. <laughs> yeah. Hugging Mark Briscoe. Um, really, really sincere emotion. I was definitely choked up seeing, seeing what happened out there today. Just was... Uh, Very tastefully done way to go about it, I think. I really loved it. I do love the legacy of brothers carrying on. It's just a a really, really nice touch. So very happy to see what we got out of that. And very intrigued to see where things go a little bit. Meet Normus saying, what's up, partners? Meet loves you. Well, we love you too, Meet Normus. Thank you so much. (laughs) We're going to talk about my partner later. (sighs) Makes me so sad. But what didn't make me sad Shibata versus Wheeler Yuta in one of the only matches that I was like, I know the outcome. Wheeler Yuta is going to win this. <laughs> I was <laughs> about very that. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and delightfully so. What a phenomenal match. Some really fun yeah. stuff here. Um, the nods to Shinsuke Nakamura, I thought was a really, really cute wink and a nod. Um, Shibata kind of giving it right back to, to Wheeler Yuta with the mentorship angles and and stuff really really fun wheeler yuda this is some of my favorite work i've ever seen him do this pure run um yeah it is so conniving to use a match with more rules to break the rules within it it's what a what a phenomenal storytelling device this is the best he's ever sounded on the mic this is the most comfortable he's looked i feel like in general i loved the story building out from the match with clark connors of saying i don't want the la dojo guys I want the teacher. I want to go after that. And then I loved the video packages we got tonight too. We haven't even really been talking about them as we've gone along, but like they've just woven in these video packages that have caught you up on the stories and not like a five minute video package way. Like we're going to be seeing all weekend, which are also great. Don't get me wrong. WrestleMania video packages make you feel like you don't have to watch the rest of the show, but these were really nice. And I loved what they did with Wheeler Yuta saying, like, I learned from this guy. I asked him what was missing from my skill set. And he said, you got to find that fire within you. And he's like, well, I'm not the same guy. And now I don't know if you have it because of everything that you've been through. What a phenomenal story going into it. And with pure rules, the rules become such a part of the story. I don't even think you need a ton of background. But Shibata winning here was such a surprise. As soon as he hit his finisher, though, you knew it was going to happen because he ain't kicking yeah. out of that. What a <laughs> Fun, fun match. And I'm also wondering, is this going to set up like LA Dojo versus the Blackpool Combat Club? Because John Moxley was there. Um, yeah. I, I think you could do something really fun at Forbidden Door with a, a showcase of both of these stables and like a, a really fun, really fun foreman or something. Yeah, I was so shocked by this. I thought Wheeler Yuta was going to be pure champ for the longest time just because Blackpool Combat Club is on a really hot run. And I think the belts look nice when they're, you know, on TV. So this was shocking to me. But I do agree. I think Wheeler Yuta, especially since the BCC heel turn, I think, this has been the best he's been. 
And I think back to the pure rules matches he had with Garcia and how great he was, but he was missing that like storytelling character attribute. But something about this iteration of Wheeler Yuta, I just buy into the fact that he's mean. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He's just good at being he's mean. Do. Yeah, and he's just very good in this role. I, it was interesting that Mox came out with him and left. Um, I, I didn't really expect Mox to hang around, but commentary really sold that Mox just trusts Yuta so much to win that he doesn't need to be there. Claudio doesn't need to be there because Yuta can win on his own. And then he didn't. So I think that is something interesting for Yuta especially because they were really teasing the Yuta best friend stuff that he's, you know, not necessarily happy in BCC that he was really taught all of this by the best friends. So I wonder if they're going to bring something about that up. Uh, but Shibata winning is such a surprise to me. I, I love it. And I think he deserves it. And I think he's good in that spot. Um, but once I kind of got the Dante Martin injury out of my mind and I got back into this, I think Shibata, I think fans are always excited to see Shibata, but I think it's always been sort of a nostalgia excitement, never like, a, oh, well, here's like, here's my champ excitement. But the pop that Shibata got when he won, I'm excited to see what he does. Like genuinely, not just as a nostalgia guy, but as a legit pure champion and a legit talent. I hadn't thought about the LA Dojo versus BCC thing for Forbidden Door, but I would love to see it. If they're not going to do Mox versus someone in a big singles or something like that. Sure. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot of fun, especially because I think New Japan needs to get a little bit more out of this Forbidden Door agreement with AEW. I think so, too. I think you're <laughs> yeah. right. Uh, for anyone in the chat who might not know, Shibata had a very real life brain bleed and it was yeah. not only likely that he might not ever wrestle again, there was a life-saving surgery that they alluded to mm -hmm. on commentary. I was glad that they they told the story for people who might not know. Um, but if, if you're watching in the chat and are like, what's the big deal? That's the big deal. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> He's only had four matches after that injury. Um, one was at Wrestle Kingdom and he kind of they had said basically went into business for himself. It was not supposed to be like a full on match because they didn't want to test that, um, which is understandable. But he also fought Orange Cassidy. We're seeing this tonight. Really, really good stuff. Um, I I also loved commentary saying that like he's viewed as the wrestler. Like that's how, how people yeah. talk about him and for him to be in a pure match just in general before he even won, they were putting over that idea of like, the wrestler in a pure match just feels right. So I'm excited to see how they lean into that. I'm guessing this will be a very short title reign. He might lose it back to Wheeler for all I know, but yeah. I think this is a really, really special moment. And what I hope is, you know, maybe for him, he gets to move past the story of his surgery. I don't think anybody's really let it go yet. And they kind of shouldn't mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, but now he kind of has something else for himself. Mm -hmm. He can probably bring that back to New Japan strong. He can defend that within the LA Dojo doing so under pure rules. Like what a fun device that follows that belt other places too, because pure rules is such an interesting style match. So really, really, really great stuff here. And I've, I'm with you. This Wheeler Yuta heel run, this Blackpool combat heel run in general, I think it's done wonders for Claudio as well. Yes. This is like the, this, asshole coffee drinking whatever is just working for me i loved it i loved it i loved it i loved it um co sending in a chat about dante and his injury saying to totally respect the rebuttal there's probably just some recency bias in there for me i feel for dante he's just been snow so snake bit injury wise so mostly his brother has has he had even worse injuries but not even a rebuttal because i mean that is there's no time that that isn't a crazy spot. I just feel like, I feel like sometimes people look at high spots and go, that's dangerous. And then sometimes we forget that all wrestling is really dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's not that um, I felt your comments were off base in any way. I just feel like we also need to acknowledge the weight of, of what just more fundamental wrestling is in, in the grand scheme of injuries. But um, it was more that that spot was a little bit more, I don't want to say it was low risk because obviously it's not, but compared to some of the other spots we, <laughs> we saw, it was like, man, that's the one. That's the one yeah. someone gets taken out on. Crazy. Ricardo saying Shibata schooled Yuta. It was great. Loved this. Such great storytelling within that. We even got the low blow from Wheeler 
and nothing came out of it. Like really just, oh, delicious stuff. Delicious. Um, so that brings us to the main event already. Jam Beard saying that TK turned heel tonight by not giving us either one of the feel good moments with Mark or Eddie winning uh, one LT photo saying, how is Eddie not the champ partner? Auntie Collins saying, I cried when Eddie lost. Pouring one out for our partner. Love you, Kate and Kylie. Auntie, I'm so glad that um, you're doing well and back yes. in our chats and on Twitter. just uh, warms my heart that you came back into the sociosphere today and felt in a good enough space to do so. Um, I have mixed feelings on this match. This felt like it was full on setting up something at Forbidden Door. Yeah. Um, the match itself was phenomenal. Like this is such a reminder of why I am such a little Eddie Kingston mark. It's not just because of gasoline wielding bloody Eddie Kingston going to set people on fire in the ring. It's not just that. It kicked up a notch when I saw that. But <laughs> he just <laughs> On Thursday, he was like, if you don't order the paper, you, you're going to feel like shit. And here's why. And I just, he, everything he does makes me feel something. Like, mm -hmm. I love so much of the high caliber wrestling that we got today. And there were a lot of things that were very emotional from the Mark Briscoe stuff. And there was some really great in-ring storytelling. For whatever reason, Eddie Kingston's just one of those guys. Sam Punk for me is one of those guys. Kevin Owens for me is one of those guys. Where when the bell rings, I'm just so invested. And it feels like every move that they make is designed to make me be extremely invested. Not taking anything away from Claudio. He made mm -hmm. me feel equally as much that son of a bitch today in this match. <laughs> um, there were so many hope spots that I bit at. I'm someone who, and a lot of people don't like matches that are agented this way. I love a million kickouts. Give me a million ear falls. Me I'm too. one of those people, <laughs> yes. especially when it's something like this, because I'm literally on the edge of my seat being like, this is the time. No, like I am fully biting when it's a match that's designed in this way. I appreciate what happened here and what happened post-match. I feel like we're running out of times that you can go to the well with Eddie Kingston and yeah. not have something major happened. You can't really turn him heel because everybody wants to cheer for him. You could. He's like a son of a bitch as a heel if you watch any of his old stuff. If you if you look up old promos of him fighting, I think it was Ilya Dragunov. I think he's an XPW. He just gives this promo about, <laughs> about how other places ask him to come in and make stars out of people. And he's just like throwing people's faces into the mat while he's delivering it. Like he is a nasty heel when you need him to be. I just feel like you had a real moment here because this was a different story for Eddie and you didn't get a different result. So much of this was about not giving into that temptation of his temper. He's focused on the championship. He was that way in all the promos. He was that way in the matches. Claudio felt like he was running out of luck a few times. I loved the lengths that Claudio went to. I love that now he's a heel. He's not really doing the swing at all because that's something the fans would want to see. Um, great, great storytelling in this match. I'm just getting a little concerned with this Eddie Kingston stuff of like, if he's not going to turn heel, it feels like it's for nothing. And if he's not going to yeah. win, what are we kind of doing here? Because we've gone back to this well over and over again. And now you're just making the heels look like they're right about things. Um, yeah. I really appreciated Nigel McGuinness in this match, like his commentary specifically commentary was great the whole night, but Nigel McGuinness just really like being in the mind of a wrestler for this whole thing and kind of the type of wrestler that Nigel McGuinness is like really walking the line between empathizing with Claudio's point of view, but not bearing Eddie Kingston in any way. Um, one of the back fists in this really sold me a ticket. Like I, I thought we were going home on it. And then there was like 10 more minutes of the match yes. left and I was just on the edge of my seat the whole time. I just feel like for Eddie Kingston, you got to now keep him away from titles for a while. And I don't want that because I want to see him face Samoa Joe. So this is tough, but like he cannot keep losing titles or Eddie Kingston, who I feel like it's impossible to make look weak. You're kind of going to make look weak if he's not going to have a change of perspective out of it, i.e. a heel turn or something like that. But the match was 
Excellent. Excellent. I also don't think this is a one and done. We got some post-match here that adds some interesting uh, elements. This is something that they might set up with Forbidden Door. Eddie, of course, always putting over Japanese talent, but doing so as we go off air, cursing a lot. Uh, okay. This was really, really fun. But I don't know. The I'm not mad about it, but I am a little exhausted by how many times we've gone to this well, Kylie. Yeah, and I think... I don't think it's just Eddie looking weaker. That would be the problem. I think fans are starting to get frustrated with it. Yeah. Because a, because in AEW, Eddie was in the spot where he's, you know, getting to a title or a big match and he's just always losing. But he's still over because fans, he's so real and they really buy into him. But it's so frustrating that he's never getting the big win when so many of his stories are based around him finally getting the big win. And in this match, commentary is talking about Eddie, you know, crawling through his career, you know, scratching to get to the top, to win the big one, to like have that validation. And in this match, he's like physically scratching Claudio. Like Claudio gets him in a pin. And he's scratching at his eyes. He's wiggling out of holds and he's doing everything he can to win this match without being Eddie Kingston, the jerk, of course. But He's just not getting there. And I don't know what the I don't know what it is. I don't know if they're they have bigger plans for Eddie, if they have something else they want him to do. But I thought this was it. And especially at the end when he gets Claudio in the roll-up. Because in my head, in a split second, I'm like, okay, Eddie wins and they protect Claudio. But it didn't happen. And I also because Yuta lost. Yes. I thought I thought maybe Claudio would lose and they because they had BCC trio stuff with the elite or blood and gods or whatever is going on over there coming up. I'm like, okay, this is a good way to like write Claudio out of ring of honor. So he can go do that in AW and it didn't happen. And I think this was the moment for it to happen for Eddie. I think fans coming into the show really thought that Eddie had a great chance and that he really needed this. He needed something. And I would like to see him against Joe, but then it, what if he doesn't beat Joe? It's, it's frustrating exactly. at this point and not in a good way. It's not like I'm frustrated for Eddie. I'm frustrated for Eddie like not winning titles. I'm frustrated for Eddie not being booked right to win titles, despite being over consistently with fans and getting these great reactions. But just this match in general, I thought the emotion was great. You could physically see Eddie desperate and really testing himself really restraining himself. Claudio was being Claudio yanking Eddie up on the apron into the power, the suplex to the outside, just being brutal. I did like at the um, kind of towards the end, he gets Eddie and kind of like a sleeper and he goes like, he's going to swing Eddie around by his neck. I love that. It's the swing, but for heels. Yeah, um, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I thought it was great. Um, I thought this match was great in a vacuum. But when you consider all the other stuff and the frustrations that I have with Eddie's booking and his run in general, because the whole point of him being in Ring of Honor is because he hates AEW, and now he comes to Ring of Honor, and it's the same stuff. Um, the post-match angle was fun. You know, Blackpool Combat Club, you know, Eddie and Shibata. It's fun. Mox wasn't there. I didn't really expect him to be there, though. Maybe this is what I mean, we're doing. there for earlier was the only yeah. weird part about that. I was like, why yeah. are you... You, were the, you came out with Wheeler, but you're not there now. <laughs> was a little odd. I will say, to your point, too, I also thought there would have been a really fun story there of, like, Wheeler use, loses, Claudio also loses. Now they're mm -hmm. like, well, now, like, Mox doesn't have gold right now. They're like, yeah. well, what the hell are we doing? We're all walking around without gold. Could be an awesome story in AEW. So yeah. it seemed like the circumstances were right to to strike while the iron was hot there. I'm I'm with you. Guys, get in your super chats and your humper chats. We're coming down the home stretch. We have made it through the super card that was a super card. This was a really, really fun pay per view. We're going to talk yeah. about where we think some stories might be going and who's going to end up where. Um, we talked a little bit about it, but I want to dig in more. I'm so intrigued because we're going to get some clarity around the rosters. I think to Kylie's point earlier, we have. Forbidden Door coming up. We have Double or Nothing coming up, but we now have ROH probably taping on a weekly basis. I don't know what their taping schedule coming out of this is, 
I'm hoping that they travel for live events again. I would really, really like that, like as a person, because I want to yeah. attend shows so bad. Uh, <laughs> it's just like my favorite thing in the world. So would love to see that. But some interesting stuff coming out of this. I'm going to go through the championship pictures with Kylie. We're going to talk about where we think things might go or where we want them to go in certain ways. Let's start with Claudio retaining. Um, I'm a bit confused here about what's next for Claudio. We've been focusing on Eddie Kingston this whole time. Is there a talent that's in Ring of Honor right now that you want to see get built up to face Claudio uh, from a singles run? I don't know. And it's so weird because if if it was Eddie, I think Ring of Honor and AW and the indies in general, there's a lot of heels that would be fun. But because it's Claudio, I don't know. Like, I don't think there's anyone ready who I think sure. could just jump right in with Claudio, at least in Ring of Honor. I mean, you could they could always just snatch someone from AEW and it would be fine, whatever. Um, but I don't know. And I almost feel like now Claudio is in a position where he might plateau as world champion because of this. I think it's a poor booking decision. I think Claudio has more to gain in losing to Eddie than he does in being champ still. Because I do think that BCC in this elite angle is just, that's just the next step for him. But I One have thing no that I idea. noticed is they alluded to their history, but they didn't dig into it. Do you think there's a chance that they run this back and Eddie wins at Forbidden Door or on TV or something like that? I think there's a great chance. I would like to see, and I'm I'm sure Eddie will cut some great promo and we'll all buy into it again and we'll want to, we'll want to see it because that's just how Eddie is. Um, I would like to see, though, if Claudio is going to be in Ring of Honor and do that story again, that's something Eddie's going to be a thorn in his side. It's going to be annoying for Claudio because Claudio is this guy who thinks he's better than everyone. He's, you know, super athletic, good looking, whatever. Um I would like to see Claudio lean into that more though, because sure. it very much does feel like as much as he was sort of uh, frustrated towards the end of the match tonight, it's very much this idea that he's like aloof. He's better than Eddie. He doesn't need to care about Eddie because Eddie's never going to beat him, but Eddie got really close. And I think that needs to shake Claudio. And I want that to come across in the story. So I would like to see Eddie win it. I just want to see Eddie do something, just move and do something <laughs> for once. Give him something. As would I. Uh, you know, the title picture is interesting right now because you could build up you could build up cheeseburger and you could do a yeah. really fun program with that. You could I I think Dalton Castle would be a really fun interim program because I think mm -hmm. if Dalton Castle loses, they don't really lose anything. There's a lot to be gained there. Um, you got Josh Woods kicking around. He's more on the heel side, but you could easily just I feel like ROH is a little less difficult right. to bridge the gaps just because yeah. of the nature of the programming chat is saying to catch them maybe um yeah I, I mean oof. to catch is an interesting one because he feels like he fits in there also might be fun just to snap together a program where you lost his title you could have you versus claudio just for some like some fun in fight in fighting yeah. But I'm intrigued to see where this goes. And I think there's going to be some pieces like, I don't think AR Fox and Blake Christian and like, I don't think that trio is sticking around as a trio. So where do those pieces go now? Like there's, yeah. there's a lot of different ways they can go with things. And I'm very intrigued to see what happens. So, um, and next for Samoa Joe, you know, I, I think the same thing. I'm, I'm not sure. I would love Eddie Kingston versus Samoa Joe. I don't want to see Eddie Kingston lose again. And to your point, I think it feels like a poor booking decision because it's kind of like to what end, right? If Eddie Kingston, if this keeps happening to him and nothing really changes, I feel like the story changed here, but I don't feel like anything for him changed. So if he's not turning heel out of it, I don't want to see him keep losing in title pictures because it just makes him look kind of like a chump, to be honest. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, any, any thoughts on what you would like to see for Samoa Joe? Do you think Wardlow comes and sniffs him out from AEW? Do you think we get a. Uh, <laughs> some some crossover there some roh talent going after joe wardlow would be fun just because i think it'd be really interesting and it wouldn't be an aw which would be fun but i would like to see samoa joe really test himself against you know someone like a blake christian or a high like a high flyer style wrestler because he was in the wardlow feud for so long that it's very much big guy versus big guy which i love but i think samoa joe as champion 
um, especially because he's getting older. I think there's, you know, a lot of room for him to really have some great, great matches. And I would like to see what he can do with someone like that. So, you know, Ring of Honor has a lot of guys like Blake Christian, like A.R. Fox, who I who I guess is A.W. and Ring of Honor, uh, Drillistico, all these people who are just incredibly skilled. And Samoa Joe is a great base, to, you, you know, and I sure. I would love to see him do a lot of that. Um, I don't know physically because Samoa Joe, he's a little banged up because he's getting older. You know, the years add up with wrestling. Uh, and he also stylistically just wrestles his balls off. <laughs> like, yeah. He is a very, very physical, spares no expense to his body kind of wrestler yeah. in the ring. I, I agree with you. I think there's some interesting possibilities there. I think you could go with some of those ROA strongholds. I loved his match versus Deppin. I know they're both heel, but that was that was a really fun showing for Tony Deppin. Um, mm-hmm. Those guys. I would like to see, they did a squash with Cheeseburger. I would like to see an actual match between them. Lucha, uh, Cheeseburger has a really fun move set with some like cool lucha moves that i I would like to see you were saying kind of like a littler guy and a bigger dude um lots of fun possibilities lots of fun possibilities um and the women's title picture too we talked a little bit about what's next for athena uh i'll ask you since we kind of already went over that who do you think ultimately dethrones athena i feel like it might be trisha door with the the way things are going so far but do you think that it's a talent that we haven't seen yet in ROH or do you think um, it's somebody who's been kicking around there for a little bit? I think, I think just for the health of the division, it should probably be someone who's been there and like works their way up in ring of honor. Um, I do think the Mercedes thing is interesting. Not that I think Mercedes is going to be ring of honor women's champion. I would love her to be, but I think if TK signs her, then AW is the natural home. Um, but if you do bring in someone from the outside to wrestle Athena, it's almost like it has to be big because Athena is so big. And mm-hmm. I think fans really love Athena. And I don't know free agent wise who really is available that is on Athena's level or higher, but maybe not AW level high. Um, But for me personally, because I love Ring of Honor, I would love them not to focus so much on bringing in stars, but on making them from the bottom up. I think there's a lot of really, really young women out there who would benefit from coming up in the Ring of Honor system just because Ring of Honor has this history. It has a legacy. It's like a label you assign to yourself. Like I came up in Ring of Honor. I succeeded in Ring of Honor. So there's lots of people like in the chat. People are saying Tootie Lynn, Billy Starks the hex i would love to see that um and i think athena would do a really great job of getting a cute a cute little baby face over uh, but i don't want to see athena lose the title soon I, want- I don't either i want her to have a healthy run that's why yeah. i kind of thought maybe trisha dora would be good because she's been featured and yeah. if people get to like she's pretty quick to fall in love with like she's she caught a lot of people's eye. I, the women's matches are consistently what we get the most chats about on Thursday nights, which just warms my heart. Um, but people really take to Trisha Dora really fast. If yeah. you get her some momentum, I think you could do some really, really interesting work. Um, and in the long run, belt her out to eventually dethrone Athena. This version of Athena, I love as ROH champ. I do want to see it in AEW because I've said a couple weeks in a row now, like, I just feel like there's nobody that's her type of heel doing what she's doing right now. Yeah. Like kind of, I, I don't watch impact consistently enough to, to make judgment calls there. They're probably closest, but there's nobody in AEW who's doing what she's doing on the main roster. Like Jade is like too cool. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> she's not like as vicious. She's just like I'm a badass and I back it up. Um, yeah, you know, we have so much going on with the outcast story. You've got like the the kind of more mean girls angles. I don't think you really have anybody that's like beating ass and then getting in the rough's face afterwards, like in the way that Athena is. So yeah, I'm loving it. Um, I I really really don't want to see her reign end anytime soon. I'm just intrigued. Back to the Eddie Kingston yeah. talk, Drew Nicholas, because he didn't send in a big enough chat earlier. What a sweetheart said. Uh, last Grand Slam Rampage when they had the ref stoppage in Eddie's match with Sammy. The crowd hated that. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Uh, and it seems <laughs> like he really hasn't won anything ever since. Uh, like, of note, it's frustrating. It is frustrating. 
Um, I also get annoyed that uh, he he beat Jericho the first time out the gate, and it didn't really go anywhere. Like that was like he won the big one finally, and then he just started losing again with all of these. So yeah, I think it's tough. I think it's they're gonna have to do something to make it work because I feel like they rely on the fact that Eddie is so good at getting you invested that they almost take it for granted. It feels like with booking like this, him quitting AEW to come to ROH, him having an attitude change where he was focused on the title and not on this, um, you know, not getting into giving into the temptations or whatever. That felt like it should have been enough of a character shift that if you're going to bother, go with it, like pull the trigger on that. So, yeah. Um, so agree with you. And yeah, that ref stoppage, God, it's both times there's been grand slams. I've been like, Eddie Kingston's going to have like such a highlight. And then, when you're closing out a two hour rampage episode, like he had a really strong showing the first time, but it was like two hour rampage after dynamite, after you've watched dark. And like, I there's local talent that I know when I go to those. So it's like, it's a full work day that you're there for. You get tired. The crowd gets tired. And then last time with the referee stoppage angle, it was like far full. I did not like it. So he needs to beat MJF have a transitional reign or just lose it back to MJF, but he needs to beat MJF at Grand Slam. That's how you can make up for it. I'll forgive. I'll forgive all this. <laughs> <laughs> That's your offer to Tony Khan. Tony, I'll forgive you if. If. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So Deanna Peraza is an interesting one. I think she just resigned with Impact, but her dethroning Athena or just facing Athena. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. Door. So good stuff. Um, really, really liked the pay-per-view tonight. Definitely some surprise booking. A lot of it that I liked, a couple that I was kind of met on, but very interested to see where they go. Nothing that I feel like is bad or damaging, just not what I was expecting. Kylie, any final thoughts here? I thought this was a great show. And I, earlier in the week, I was said I was most excited for this show over any other show this weekend. Uh, and I feel like it really delivered. I think... I think there were some small mistakes that were made, some booking errors, things I wouldn't have done, but I can see the reason behind most of them. So I'm trusting the process. I'm excited to see where this goes on TV though, especially with especially with Eddie and the, and the Lucha Bros. Those are the two things coming out of this show that I'm most excited to hear more about. I love that. And I'm also just excited to see how they break out these episodes moving forward. You know, we pretty consistently have two hour episodes, but they're on a streaming service. So are they going to go back to a one hour format now that they're through these mass tapings mm -hmm. or are they going to stick to two or are they going to do an hour and 37 minutes? Cause darn it, they can, it doesn't matter. I'm intrigued to see what we get moving forward. And just my thing, even more than the stories, I'm just intrigued to see who's delineated to what rosters and, yeah. and what that ends up looking like. Kylie, thank you so much for sitting in with me. I know this was a, a long <laughs> one and a late pay-per-view, and it's at the beginning of our WrestleMania weekend. So much going on here at FIFA. I'm going to let Kylie plug her shit and get out of here. But before she does, I'm going to remind you to subscribe to Fightful Select. There was a huge update on CM Punk that already feels obsolete after one Instagram story. There yeah. are updates on uh, Vince McMahon and how he is affecting or not affecting the sales process. So much stuff on Fightful Select. There's going to be plenty more of it coming out of WrestleMania weekend. Also, a ton of interviews that are just happening at Fightful in general right now. Absolutely, absolutely love to see it um, with talent that you're going to be seeing this weekend. Some really, really fun stuff there. Whew, I got to go into Excalibur mode for the rest of what we have on the, <laughs> the content <laughs> live. But you had a multiverse yesterday. You had ROH yesterday. You have night one of WrestleMania here on the Fightful Main with Sean, and I don't know who's co-hosting, but you have Alex Pulowski and myself behind the paywall for night one of WrestleMania. You also have Alex Pulowski and I for Stand and Deliver, which I'm assuming is going to start around 4 o'clock Eastern for the post show. We don't really know. Night two, you can also catch me and Alex Pulowski behind the paywall at Fightful Select and Sean on the main channel again. But... Then we're just back into our regular routine after this crazy, crazy weekend. And you can catch Kylie doing her thing, doing some tag talk, living her best life. Plenty <laughs> of stuff going on for Kylie. What you got going on for us? Well, tag talk this Monday, 3 p.m., Fightful Overbook. Um, Haley's coming back to the show. <gasps> Haley's 
Haley's my co-host. She's been on a little what? bit of hiatus. Yeah. Haley's big return is this Wednesday. I don't care about WrestleMania weekend. I barely care about Supercard <laughs> of Honor. Haley is coming back to tag talk. I hope she gets like a, when wrestlers come back from an injury. I hope she gets the big return pop for Haley. <laughs> we love to see it. That's awesome. So tune into that Wednesday. Yeah. And I have some other things I'm working on. Um, nothing I can say yet, but you should follow me on Twitter for more about that at Fuller underscore Kylie. And I'll, I'll post it on there when I can. <laughs> Coming this Wednesday, Kylie has a major announcement on things that she can't tell you yet, but no. Uh, I just wanted you to take the the Tony Khan approach. Is it a partnership with Shazam? Can you tell us whether or not it's a partnership with Shazam? I cannot confirm or deny whether She didn't deny it, folks! <laughs> she didn't deny it. You can follow me at Miss Kate Fabe for my whole list of silliness that I'm doing, but you can catch me behind the paywall all weekend, like I said. Also on Mondays, doing the Raw Sour Graphs post show there. Tuesdays on the main channel doing the NXT extremely sour, but very fun post show that we have. Wednesdays at the Mark Order podcast at Mark Order talking all things all elite. Thursdays doing the ROH review because I'm the luckiest girl in the whole wide world. Handed it off to the Impact crew on the same stream. We pass it off to Joel and Cresta. They're incredible. And Fridays normally I'm doing the AEW Rampage and SmackDown review. But what I'm extremely excited about April 7th and 8th, I'm at Excite Wrestling, not only doing commentary, but we're doing our own media scrum beforehand. We're going to try and stream it out to you at twitch.tv slash Excite Wrestling. You guys can ask questions. Uh, I'm going to be there with their ring announcer, Chris, who is from WrestleNomics. And we're going to just be talking about our roles in media. You'll get to see some Excite Wrestling talent as well as hopping on the commentary desk. I will have Spindrift and Muffins in all likelihood because I know what I'm doing over here, people, all right? <laughs> she knows how to plug her stuff. She's She's got Haley coming back. She's leaving teasers out. Tune in on Twitter. <laughs> find me on Wednesdays to find out my other projects coming up. But really appreciate you guys. Hey, have a safe and wonderful wrestling weekend. There's so much wrestling. Watch what you like. If you're watching WrestleMania, enjoy it. Supercard is a hell of a show to have to follow up. So I'm very excited to see what happens there. Go follow Kylie. She's awesome. We're out of here.